So I am delighted to, uh, shall I start again? I am delighted, Bryony, to invite you onto our podcast. And you are a journalist, an author, a podcaster, an advocate for mental health, a mother, a daughter, a partner, and you've written seven books and one novel. So we have a lot to talk about. And my first question on this podcast is, tell me about a challenge you've been facing or have had to overcome. Oh, I mean, where would I start? <laughs> uh, a challenge I've been, well, I suppose a challenge I've been facing recently is, has been um, uh, men pairing menopause. That's been oh, really wow. hard. Yeah, I, I got very unwell again earlier this year with obsessive compulsive, well, I think over the whole of the pandemic with obsessive compulsive disorder, which I've had since I was a child, but I'd sort of felt I'd reached a really good place in my recovery from it. But um, that that came up again really badly earlier this year. And I thought, oh, it must be the pandemic. But then there were a few other things that came at the same time. And we realised I was actually going through an early menopause. So that has been a challenge I have faced, but that I, I feel I am sort of getting through now. But I've, I've, you know, life is just a series of challenges, isn't it, really? It is. And it's about, I, I find that increasingly it's about learning the tools so that I don't have to um, pick up any of the sort of maladaptations that I learned in my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> to get through those challenges so my like general challenge is get through challenges without picking up a drink or a drug or throwing myself into food or work obsessively and addictively basically because in a way what you're saying is that life is difficult and it will remain difficult and there will always be some you know there isn't this kind of nirvana that you get to where everything is sorted and then you're in this calm happy place and life just no. unfolds in this kind of happy ever after picture that we've been sold really falsely sold haven't we in the, all the stories as children yeah um, and and by the sort of way the world is set up really capitalism consumerism all of it you know um i think yeah that's my sort of biggest mistake i think the thing that made me deep mate has made me deeply unhappy in in my life generally has been um has has been the expectation of happy if you see what i mean it's been the sort of pressure i've put on happy uh, the happy ever after, as you say, that that thing of I am only successful if I'm happy or I'm in a good place. And of course, that that isn't the case. Do you know what I mean? Like feelings are there for a reason. Obviously, happy is great. Happy is wonderful. Do you know what I mean? But it's not particularly realistic to expect to be happy all the time, you know. Um, and I'm certainly a lot more content content's a good word isn't it Julia yeah I think content is more <laughs> realistic but yeah. in some ways there are so many I mean there are lots of kind of light bars going off in my head first of all with kind of early menopause how ignorant we all have been that our hormones have such an impact on our mental health and that any pre-existing fault line is exacerbated if our hormones drop um, and I guess what I'd like to go back a step is you know there are so many sides of you there's this incredibly successful productive you who writes seven books produces a podcast has a column on the telegraph and writes a very clever smart coherent narrative you know, that we, uh, that is very kind of energised and very trans transmittable, you know, that you you have a very powerful force of giving understanding to all the things that really matter to you. And then there is this other side to you, which, you know, you call your book The Mad World, where you feel chaotic, where you have OCD, where you've uh, had alcoholic issues, where you've 
got it, as I say, OCD, where you've had lots mm-hmm. of, and even got to the extent of being suicidal. And I guess for anyone listening, it's hard to understand how you reconcile these two what seem like polar opposites. Well, I don't, you know, actually, increasingly, Julia, I, I don't think those two things, you know, are, there is not that, there is not that much uh, space between success as we perceive it in the modern world and those feelings of despair and um and suicide and actually if i've learned one thing in my career as a journalist certainly in doing mad world um and 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 in recovery and meeting people is that most of the the most successful quote unquote and i'm doing waving fingers in my air in the air right now for people who are you know because obviously this is a podcast um most of the six most successful people i have met or interviewed have are deeply troubled you know, and their and their success is driven from a place of a sense of failure, a sense of despair. I, you know, there's all sorts of different reasons for that. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I think that the was the more unhappy one is in themselves, the more they are driven to try and make up for it with external factors. Hence the success, and that's certainly what I have discovered. So, I you know actually. I, I think that sort of very binary view that you're either down or out or you're, you know, you're, you're, you're in the gutter or you're looking at the stars. We're all much more of a melee and a mess of all of it, if you see what I mean. Um, but, and that they're you know, much I, more interlinked. Got... And that they're much yeah, more interlinked. And, totally... and I've got to a stage in my life and my career where, you know, if I'm being really honest, and this is, you know, you're Julia Samuel, so that's what I need to be with you. And, yeah. you know, it's a podcast called Therapy Works. But you know, the more, um, I suppose, well I get as a person, the less I see those metrics and values of success as I don't, I don't know how possible they are. I don't know how possible it is to be an all round well person and also striving to be the best at everything. And certainly for me, from the moment I, um, from my childhood, from my like early teens, that was my way of getting people to like me. You know, like if I could that's the way I learn if I could be good at things and if I could work hard and if I could succeed then my mum and dad will like me (laughs) you know that is not any bearing on my mum and dad at all do you know what I mean like that's often that is the kind of the thing we put in as parents isn't it do well do well and it's a you know and it's a very it's a very familiar um you know thing for us to be achieving and striving for but as I have got older, I have, I've, I see that the more I strive for success, the more I'm trying to like, if I'm trying to grow myself on Instagram or trying to be like, oh, I need to sell this many copies or reach this many people, I'm usually trying to shrink myself and it's painful. Do you know what I mean? And I, and I, and so there's, there comes a point where you have to go, oh, this doesn't, this external stuff isn't working that much you know and and i think that's certainly where i am right now in my life i mean that's such a fascinating insight and i i really agree with you it's like when you find yourself working super hard to get more and more attention or more and more you know as you could say quote success and recognition and maybe income often maybe not always often the driver beneath is feelings of inadequacy and that the real you is smaller and smaller and the meal the real you is a kind of a baby screaming that is crying out for attention um that is longing to be held i guess and to know that you're in love you are loved and lovable however you are that you don't have to perform and succeed to be loved yeah absolutely and is it you know and underneath it all is it that's a that, yeah there's a huge amount of fear isn't there you know um 
And I often think that is a life is is eventually is essentially what life is. You spend if you're lucky, if you're really lucky, and you live until you're in your eighties or nineties or whatever. Is the first half of your life sort of you being fucked up by the world around you? <laughs> and then is the, is the second half you trying to unfuck yourself from all the things, all those maladaptations that you've learned? Does that make sense? It does make sense. I mean, it, it's a bit binary, isn't it? Because again, with this whole idea of happy ever after or what we perceive as success isn't necessarily the thing that gives us a sense of, uh, what is it we're looking for? I think I, I think I'm looking for a sense of belonging, maybe, and a sense of calm. So I don't think it's about kind of unpicking all the mistakes we made early on, because some people don't make their mistakes until quite a lot later. But I, what mm. I, what I, what I really get from you is that with each step forward you find another part of yourself that you need to connect to so that it's whether it's your body image or whether it's addiction or whether it's, you know, having being OCD, but all of them come from a kind of very early sense of being defective in some way. And I imagine in therapy, you've begun to interrogate that because what I mean, you know, one of my questions is what do you think it is about these experiences that was particularly challenging for you and i don't know what that is uh, what the with the what the experience like for well, life generally sometimes i i suppose i was i've i've always felt i've always found life sort of generally baffling and like i don't you know i i've always found i've always felt quite um other not other but like i haven't i've I've always found it hard to belong and feel part of something um but do you have that do you have that i mean because when you write you have a very clear narrative and a lot of wisdom so that there are two things happening at the same time aren't there i mean that you're very powerfully saying what's difficult in life and you have an understanding of it and yet still there's this feeling of feeling baffled, even as you write a clear narrative. Well, also because it's sort of the writing is, has always been my way of going, hey, is anyone else baffled by this? <laughs> because I kind of, I suspect they must be. Because because if I'm going through this, other people must be going through this. Do you know what I mean? Because I can't be as like freakish as my brain keeps telling me I am. Like, I can't, surely I'm not the bad person my brain wants me to believe I am. And so I need to check this. I need to know. I need to know. Like, and maybe I am. And and if that's the case, then, okay, I'll, I'll have to do what I have to do. But I have this hunch that maybe there are other people out there who feel like this as well. And, like, perhaps we could, like, all get together and chat and feel a bit better and belong, you know? And so, and that really is where all of my writing and all of my books have come from. And it, you know, there was no kind of, um, there was never any uh, clear cut path or plan for this, you know, it was like, it came out writing about first my obsessive compulsive disorder. That was, a, that came from, that was, came out of desperation because I, I, I was like, if I can put this in the Telegraph, this paper that I had worked for, for so long, and I'd been writing, you know, I'd, I'd done all sorts of stuff, features into, you know, I was a jobbing features writer. And, but I was like, if I can put this in black and white, and then the readers can see it, and then the police, if the police don't come and get me, you know, then maybe I'm okay. And then also, if even better, people come and say, it was like a way of reclaiming the OCD. And also then maybe people will come to me and say, oh, me too. And and that that was exactly what happened. Do you know what I mean? But in, in, in a, on a scale far larger than I ever could have imagined, you know. And, and that's what led to me writing Mad Girl and starting up Mad World and and and, and, settling, and starting mental health mates because it was all like trying to connect with those with I suppose with people like me who had felt unable had felt sort of lost or or 
or like we don't belong, you know, because we didn't fit the conventional narrative. Um, and that's so yeah. kind of core to us as human beings, isn't it? That when we feel othered, when we feel outside of the tribe, from a biological, evolutionary biology, biological perspective, we are under threat. Our life is in danger. And so in some ways it was by having the courage to own and name your difficulties and your sense of isolation that actually opened the door to you finding your tribe. But but what I mm. what I'm not clear on is mm. having had this massive response and these different um pathways into you, have they actually met you inside? Do you feel like you belong there? Definitely more. They've definitely led me to find out new things about myself. So I think from, it was only really from writing about OCD and the and mad girl, I, I really put, connected a lot of the dots. Um, what were the dots that you connected? Well, that, you know, I drank and used drugs in a way that was not unhealthy. It, it was not healthy and it wasn't all just about... Seeking can pleasure. You, can, for my podcast producer, can you not move around quite so much? Oh, sorry. Sorry. I'll try not to. <laughs> Should we say that bit again? Because there was a lot of um, background. Connect, connecting the dots. Um, I suppose about, I, I suppose really it made me realise that I had a problem with alcohol, with drugs, um, that the way I lived my life was not, I, I didn't have to continue to live it like that, you know, because I was thrown into this world of mental health campaigning and meeting lots of other people who um, who had experienced similar things, but I was being shown different ways of living, if that makes sense. And and so, yeah, I, I, I but I do have to be really careful, Julia, that I don't become... I can become as addicted to validation, if you see what I mean, yeah. as I was to alcohol or drugs. And that's, I suppose, the the challenge I have at the moment is, is that I think that, I think that, so I'm now five years sober. Go I, you, <laughs> yeah, by yeah, the yeah. way. <laughs> but I think that for the first three or four years, I was the thing that was keeping me sober was other people's validation. If I'm being really honest, like you're okay, Briny, you're okay. You're not just okay. You're you're great, Briny. And I was like, oh yeah, I, I I am not the bad person. I think I am, and and that's lovely. And you know, and and social media provided that very neatly. You know, uh, followers, all of that stuff. And then I think about a year ago, a year and a half ago, I started to realise that that didn't work anymore and that was probably as hollow <laughs> as the drugs and the alcohol and so now I have to be quite careful can I pause it can I pause yeah. you there mm -hmm. so that your the thing that helps you that is your kind of part of your superpower is letting yourself learn from your own awareness so you didn't get stuck in this next phase of you know, in some ways being a dry drunk and using validation and, and followers to meet the pain rather than kind of deal with the pain or kind of under, find ways of expressing your pain, you recognised that there was another chapter in your relationship with yourself and this and this version of yourself and, your, and you, how you manage the discomfort within your body that comes up in many different ways. Yeah. Oh, you think that's my superpower? Yes. <laughs> that's nice. Oh, oh, look, I'm seeking validation from you, Julia. <laughs> I uh, think, but I, can I, can I pause there too? I don't mm -hmm. think there's anything wrong with seeking validation. We are wired to connect. We are wired to be mm -hmm. in relationship and interdependent. I think it's when the balance of it tips to that's all that we have. And so we have this feeling of emptiness and deficit inside. But I think relationally, moment to moment, having a hug, checking out, kind of getting little little moments of being met and feeling valued, I think is very meaningful and very important. Yeah, 
Oh, I absolutely agree. And I, I think for me, it's about finding that balance. <laughs> and I'm not that good at finding balance. But I think um, I, what's wonderful and what certainly helps me in my personal life to navigate all of this stuff and that I wouldn't, I don't think I'd be able to make those um, uh, to question myself and have that self-awareness if I didn't have, you know, when I got sober, I started, I, I use a 12 step. I'm part of a 12 step program. And um, that certainly has provided me with um, some recovery tools that are incredibly powerful really when are. I find myself in situations like that. Um, and, and that was when I, I go, oh, look, I'm using something else, <laughs> you know. And but it, that is what and it's, it's and it, and it, built to do, though. I mean, AA is built to replace mm -hmm. one addiction with another more functioning addiction, isn't it, really? Well, not addiction. Well, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. But it's, I think, what I, I, what I think I'm sort of, I'm really interested in is how there are a lot of acceptable addictions out there that we encourage and, and a lot of society kind of works from a place of addiction and hope, you know, our phones are yeah. entirely uh, set up and indeed created to work on the addictive process, social media, food you know so much food is now you know processed and created to make us want more 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 um work that is you know the way we 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 idolize people who who frankly have quite unhealthy working relationships and you know so i i'm really interested in how in a way we we have this perception of addiction and certainly I did for a long time as well. And that perception helped to keep me in it, ironically. But that an addict was someone in an alleyway, a shooting up, or it was an old man on a park bench, you know, and obviously that is that that is part of addiction, but it's not all of it. Um, but I also came to a point uh, just over five years ago where I had to realise that I also was an addict, you know, and I... And and I so that I could see that I was an alcoholic, and I could see that I had massive problems with drugs, with cocaine, and um, but it's funny because after now the more work I do or the more um, time I put in to looking at myself internally as opposed to everything externally, the more I realise that I'm addicted. You know, there's all sorts of things that I use in an addictive way. Works definitely one of them. You know. Um, What's your definition of food? Addiction? <laughs> yeah, food. It's when I, th it, uh, it's when I think that you, uh, well, my addiction, my definition is, is broadly speaking, the twelve step definition, which is that you're, um, you're powerless over something, and your life has become unmanageable because of it. Yeah, I mean, and, that I can fits, and it's your primary, those... <laughs> it's your primary relationship, isn't it? Is your addiction? It yeah, overrides and, all yeah. your other relationships. Yeah, and I I could totally slip into that that place with work, can't you? I mean, can't a lot I? of us are encouraged to. Yeah, I mean, you're a therapist, so it's different. But I know. Perhaps... Just just to pause you there. I mean, I have definitely used work to save me at times and to give me a sense of. I definitely used it as a sense of validation mm -hmm. um, and to have meaning and connection. If I'm sort of not, if I feel chaotic and out of control at work, it definitely gives me a kind of balancing when I step out of myself. And, and sometimes that's good. And sometimes yeah. it's too much. It's definitely too much. But I think where you're really insightful is this idea of this hierarchy of addiction, like drugs and alcohol are morally decrepit and disgusting um, and that somehow they're weak willed. But those people who are addicted to work and very successful or um, social media or whatever it is, that somehow those, because they feed into a consumer frame of what is good about life and that success equals happiness, which is, you know, pretty uh, shaky. Mm. Um, what is that? It's a shaky... Well, it's shaky ground to be on. Shaky mm. ground. Um and so have you, you kind of, 
your awareness and being in a community and learning from other people has helped you. Where are you in your learning now? And what, what have you learned? I'm at the stage of my learning where I accept I have a lot more to learn. Yeah. But and that that I'm learning life. all the time. But I'm That's not a bad point. place to be, though, isn't it? Like, that we... No, I... I always think that I like actually the moment in a way I've always strived. I'm like, I need to know all the answers. That's been my thing. If I know what's going on everywhere and understand it and can, can, I can then have, maybe I'll be able to somehow control it. <laughs> and that of course is bollocks. Right? Yeah. And so now I think I've got to the stage where I'm like, I don't, I don't have a clue. I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a clue really what's going on even inside my body you know i don't i uh but and that's okay like if i don't know or if i don't know what the meaning of life is that like that's that's okay and in fact that's kind of fun and exciting like i don't know what's around the corner you know i don't know what's what's what the universe has got in store for me this afternoon well i broadly speaking know, you know um because i'm gonna go and meet a friend for a coffee and i've got to that's write nice. what, I've got to do some writing <laughs> But I don't, you know, I don't, it's, you know, I woke up this morning and I was like, right, I'm going to go to do um, personal training. And then I've got a thing with Julia. And then my editor at the Telegraph calls me up and says, Bryony, can you write something on edition for tomorrow's paper on this? And I'm like, okay. And suddenly my day shifts entirely, but uh, there'll be an energy from it, you know? So who knows? But in a way, what not me. Was... <laughs> <laughs> but there is the paradox <laughs> Isn't there by acknowledging that we don't fundamentally have control and we don't fundamentally know and that we kind of let God and let go that that is in itself liberating when we feel mm -hmm. we can nail down control by having knowledge by working hard by proving that we're right and everybody else is wrong or whatever our version of having control is in some ways that's what drives us mad. Mm. Yeah, I, I definitely think that um, trying to control the outcome of things is has, has, has made me really unwell. Yeah. So are you, this may be too personal a question and you can ignore me, given that you know yourself better um, and you're the daughter of a journalist, I don't know what your father did, does. Oh, he's... Um... <laughs> It's a really good question. He's eighty now, so he's okay. uh, he's very. Uh, but he he sort of. Um, I don't really. I don't really know Julia. I've never really worked it out. Okay. <laughs> but it's sort of um, <laughs> public affairs, politics stuff. Okay. Um, public yeah. affairs, politics stuff. Are you? And you have a daughter. So I have a daughter. Yeah. Looking at where you came from, the parenting you received and knowing yourself and the parenting that you're doing, kind of where are you at with all of that? Well, can I, can I skip not that answer one. that? Yes, can we skip that just because that. it's, there's, there's, there's so um... much. There's a lot. Yeah. Stuff. Okay. Skip that. <laughs> that, that we can, we can discuss over a coffee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can we talk about your daughter at all, about what are the things that you've learned that you want her to learn? Yeah, I don't mind broadly speaking about that. No, it's just my own parents. I, yeah. I, I, um, so I'll I, start again. So do, you, do you, okay. I'm really interested in how, you know, we inherit patterns and we pass patterns down. And I'm wondering how what you've learned influences your parenting. <laughs> I mean... Sometimes I feel like I'm, this is, and this is going to sound bonkers and not very responsible, but sometimes I feel like I'm growing up with my child, Yeah, <laughs> which says, but um, I have found that what parenthood has been for me was a, it, it was a really powerful motivator to get better and get well. Okay. So, Can you start oh, with that? Sorry. Tapping? Sorry. I'm like it's a headmistress. Really, 
I know. I'm like, ah. sorry. Uh, it's been a it's been a really powerful motivator to get well and to get better. So, and it took me time. Don't get me wrong. I was my daughter was four when I got sober, and it, but it was it is what it is. We are where we are. Um, but it does it does tell us that love is transformative, in that you loved her enough that you wanted to be different. I mean, that in a way you couldn't love yourself, maybe. And you were destroying mm. yourself because you were needed to block the pain or that was your only mechanism for blocking the pain. But in the end, your love for her was what motivated you to want to get well because you wanted her to have a loving, sober mum. Well, she, she deserved better. She deserves, you know, the world. But the other interesting thing I've learned with parenting is that I suppose I always had this notion that children were like mini versions of you. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of very much something we have in society of like our mini me's and, oh, they're just like their dad or they're just like their mum. And, and actually what interests me most about my daughter is how she's herself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's and so lovely. She's not, an, she's, she's not an extension of me or my husband, you know, um, and she never should be. A child never should be. You know, mm. and I think that has been the really key learning, the thing that has transformed parenting for me um, has been that just allowing and accepting, you know, and loving even when, you know, that thing of in unconditional love of um we love you when you're throwing a tantrum. We love you when you're howling with laughter. We love you when you're sitting on the loo. <laughs> we love you, you know, I don't know, whatever. I will always love her. You know, it's not dependent on how she behaves. And that's the complete opposite of, in some ways, what were your drivers, isn't it? In the sense of needing to perform to be good enough. What you're talking about is that you're loving her for who she is, authentically, congruently herself, when she drives you nuts, when you kind of hate her, when you're too exhausted, you will always love her. And she knows that you love her however she is, yeah. whoever she is. I hope, I hope so. I mean, and again, it's, it's, I, I make mistakes and Don't I... All. I don't also, I don't begrudge or resent my parents at all for coming with like using that model of parenting because everyone, <laughs> newsflash, everyone in the 80s was using that model of parenting. So yeah. it's not, it's not like they were, you know, it was just what, you know, we, they want it also that came from a place of wanting the best for me. They want me to be happy, you know? Yeah, yeah and to do well and obviously i want my child to do well but i also want her to um be able to not do well does that make That's sense her, well i think what you're saying is you want her to be herself yeah and 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 to understand i think so much of i feel incredibly lucky to have kind of come of age i suppose uh, that i that I'm not my part of my parents' generation because I think that we live at a time now where the, we're just so much more um, articulate about uh, mental well-being, mental health, mental illness, all of which are sort of different things. I think um, the vocabulary is there in a way that it it perhaps wasn't, and the um, knowledge and but, the re research, yeah. Yeah, and the research, yes. And just, you know, there will be things I I imagine we'll look back on in a hundred, well, we won't because we won't be here, but, you know, our great-grandchildren will look back on and go, I cannot believe that they used to behave like that or do that or think that think that it was cool to kind of, um, to, or you know, the, the mind-body connection wasn't there or something. Um, and so I don't, I have no... I certainly, yeah, I don't resent my parents at all for that. Um, I, I think I'm th over time. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, as my children... But I'm certainly not in this... <laughs> as certainly as but my children... But I think children, that's perfectly normal. Yeah, and as my children do me. But in some ways, it's freeing to recognise 
that your parents were doing the best they could given who they were and the time that they lived rather yeah. than constantly being angry and resenting them because that's like self-harm isn't it just poisons yourself yeah but i think you probably have to do a bit of that to get to the other thing totally don't you? and you have to have the conversations with them yeah yeah <laughs> But yeah, so anyway, um, I'm sure, I mean, all, on a daily basis, my daughter goes through that, you know, with me. I hate you. <laughs> I hate my life. And I'm like, whoa. And, and uh, you know, we do our best. And we go again. And it is the going again. And also where you love most, you hate most and make your deepest mistakes. Because, mm -hmm. you know, indifference is the opposite of love, isn't it? Where you kind of don't give a shit. Um, mm -hmm. And so where we really love is also where we fuck up, basically. Yeah. And we learn by fucking up. Yeah. When we let ourselves and don't just attack ourselves. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, I learned that from my daughter. Her teacher says to her, how do we learn? By making mistakes. Good teacher. Good teacher. So, Bryony Gordon, do you have any questions for me? Um, questions for you. Uh, okay. What do you think? Um, mm, this is a really good question that you've just asked me. How do I move, continue what happens what would you advise to people who because this is i suppose addiction is sort of runs through me and i i spent most of my life wanting to do the right thing but needing to do the wrong thing what advice would you give to like someone who right now feels like they're sort of split in two? That is such a good question, isn't it? Like those two competing mindsets, if you like, of longing to do the right thing to get loved and belong and feel of worth and the pain of that being so great that we end up doing all the things that are the completely opposite of getting our needs met and then sets up this horrible looping cycle of self-loathing when our kind of longing is, is, is this to be connected and to be loved and yet what we do means that we hate ourselves first more than anybody else and criticise ourselves first but then also do behaviours that um, are sabotaging so that people kind of step away from us. And I think, you know, we are as different on the inside as we look on the outside so that each of us has our own unique map of this and so that we have to kind of know what our own map is, that what are the, where are the holes that we go in, what are the kind of sources of pain for us, like there isn't a one size fit, fits all answer. But if I had a kind of, if I was working with you as a client, I think what we would do is go back and look at your kind of early stuff to begin with. What was the landscape that built you in connection and um, attachment with yourself and, and your kind of care providers? What are those early patterns and memories really of of disruption of where the kind of where the pain comes from because you can't really begin to repair what happened until you know what happened so i think you need and some things we won't remember but i think we all need a kind of story that makes sense enough for ourselves of where we've come from and name what that is and name what's going on and then that gives us a capacity to turn to ourselves with self-compassion you know and i have lots of clients who say to me well everyone says to, you know self-care self-compassion <laughs> you know i don't know what that is i don't know what that feels like and 
I, I get that. It is hard. But I think it's finding our innate sense of love, which is in all of us that we are born with, and gently, and sometimes only for a few moments, turning it towards ourselves. So putting down that very critical, attacking, cruel lens, and like going, Oof. and in that moment, something changes. I don't think we remove the injuries from the past, but I think when you kind of really let yourself turn to yourself with a bit of warmth and less vicious attack, something changes. And I think from that moment, you can use that and grow that. And I do think what we allow ourselves to think about and where we put our attention and having an insight of whether we're being critical or, or supportive and compassionate and loving helps change our relationship with ourselves and the story we tell ourselves. And then that changes the person we become and our outcome. That was a very long answer. Oh, it was a really beautiful answer, though. It had me tearing up a bit. Did it? What, what bit of it mm. kind of got to you? The moment where you spoke about talking to ourselves with love and uh, putting aside that critical voice. I was thinking this morning I went, did, um, I do strength training and my lovely strength trainer said, she got me throwing this very heavy kind of central Ooh. sack of sand. Yeah. And um, she said to me, I don't want to know who you're thinking of while you're throwing that because there's some real, <laughs> there's some real like <sighs> rage going in. And actually what was interesting was I wasn't thinking of a person or someone I was angry with. I was thinking of that critical voice I have with myself, you know, because I was like, I just want to put that down. I want to put that down. I don't even want to, I don't even want to criticize it. I just want to put it down and be like, enough. Um, so yeah, do, that really spoke to me. Do you know about the work of Dick Schwartz and internal family systems and his idea of parts that we all have parts of ourselves mm -hmm. and his idea of there are no bad parts in the sense that we've developed when we were suffering mechanisms that were there intentionally to kind of protect us from pain and that your critical voice was, I guess, an early part that is there to kind of push you to get your needs met. And really his work is about giving each part of ourselves, and we all have lots of different parts, a voice and a space and understanding what their intention is for us, what they're there for. And then that allows them to connect with our core self, which is the bit that you felt in that moment when I said, when you turn to yourself with kindness, that connected with a, a kind of core like self, where you can just allow yourself to be. Mm. Yeah just to be all parts of us good and bad and I think that's the other thing is that I think growing up I had this notion that the bad parts of me had to be got rid of and they had to be uh cut out that, uh, yeah because for some, maybe other people didn't have bad parts to them you know and then actually what recovery and therapy has shown me is that we all are a mass of parts some are good some are bad and we accept all of ourselves and so when i go into a horrible place of obsessive compulsive like an episode of obsessive compulsive disorder and i get terrible you know intrusive all intrusive thoughts are terrible so by painful. Them. they're intrusive i can see, can i just pause of, a second can i just pause a yeah. moment and say you say it very fast like it's just a thing and I wanted to acknowledge how painful intrusive parts are. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. But I find that as I've got older and if I've done more work on myself, it's not judging myself for having those thoughts um, because they are just thoughts. I heard something 
someone said once recently, which really, really helps me, which was, you are not your thoughts. You're just the person that hears them. Oh, that's lovely. And that helps me. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? And that yeah. really helps me to not get sucked into them because the more I get sucked into them, the more baby, the more baby intrusive thoughts born, <laughs> you know, whereas if I just go, Oh, there you go. Well, that was interesting. And then I move on, you know, and that is a version of mindfulness. No, like don't dig into them. Yeah. Just let them come through you. Let them have their voice, hear them, let them be. And then you can stay in the moment rather than, trying to kind of nail them down or block them mm -hmm. and I think that's what you're really learning and I think all of us need to learn me included is that we can't Marie Kondo tidy ourselves internally to make us just all tidy like our sock drawer that we have lots of different feelings and there isn't one bad one or one good one but that is who we are because we're sentient human beings and to allow the multi versions of ourselves multi dimensions and feelings of ourselves to live rather than mm. try and b cut them out or or drink them out or drug them out or money them out or shop them out or mm. Yeah, but maybe we, we have to do all of those things to get to that stage. You know, I'm, you know, I'm in a way grateful for alcohol and drugs because I don't know what, I, what was I, how else was I supposed to live without them? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, what, of course I drank and of course I did drugs because I was in so much pain and my, yeah. I didn't know how to deal with it. No one had given me a toolkit, you know, and no one does, but, um, you know. So the pain worked. is your friend in a way when you let it they worked until they stopped working, you know, and here I am talking to you. Very alive. And what are you? I, what I get from you and how I guess I'd like to end the podcast is that you are really a woman who is allowing and finding ways of being yourself fully. And that is both scary and terrifying and difficult and exciting and positive and energizing. Thank you. That's lovely. That's a, that, I like that. Does that fit? It does fit. Yeah. I'm trying to be myself fully. I'm trying to, get, trying to climb through all those layers I put on to find me. And you're on your way. And that's the best you can do. So on that, shall we end? Love. Yeah. Thank you so much for my therapy session, Julia. Thank you so much for joining me, Prani. That's whizzed past. <laughs>